Amanda Cadego is going to tell us about um, human brain organoids. That it really this topic can transform our knowledge of human brain development. Uh, she has created in the first single cell molecular map of human corticogenesis. My question for you, you can answer it at the end, is uh, do you think that these organoids are conscious? Thankfully, no. <laughs> then we'll start with Take that. Away, Amanda. <laughs> thanks, Lance. Um, and thanks to the organizers, especially Wendy and Claudia, for, for guiding us through all the COVID complications of this conference. I wish we were all in Florence, but it's really exciting to be together virtually today. Um, so yeah, so we're going to transition a little bit from thinking about cancer to neurodevelopmental disorders um, and the exciting studies we heard about in actual human disease to thinking about how to model uh, in actual human tissue, to thinking about how to model human tissue and especially developing human tissue in the lab with organoids. Um, so some background on me, I'm a computational biologist, so you'll see some of that uh, technical stuff coming up in the talk. And I am super honored to work with Paula Arlotta, Joshua Levin, and Aviv Regev. So all the work I'm going to talk about today comes out of uh, so the great collaborations between those groups. Um, so there is definitely a need to model human tissue in the lab. We'll, we'll start with that. So uh, first of all, just a lot of the knowledge that we have from brain comes from incredible uh, model organisms like mice. Um, but we know, of course, that the human brain is maybe especially out of most tissues different from other organisms. Um, and so due to all those differences, we really need to study specifically human. But uh, most neurodevelopment occurs in utero. And so we're never going to have access to that tissue um, over time other than the occasional precious samples of a biopsies at a specific point in time. Um, and finally, when we're thinking about neurodevelopmental disorders, these are all very complex genetically um, diseases. So hundreds of genes that are all interacting with each other. Um, and so if you want to study the specific effect of a gene or a environmental trigger or anything like that, um, it really needs to happen in a uh, human genetic background. Um, and so that's why we're focusing on uh, human tissue um, and on creating that human tissue in the lab over, so we can study it over time. Um, so a few years ago, our groups uh, developed a new uh, protocol for developing human brain organoids. There, there are several out there in the field. Um, this protocol is particularly reproducible um, and particularly forms these, uh, the human forebrain, a specific region of the brain uh, that's very distinct between humans and other organisms. So I'm actually going to switch my screen so you can see this video running. Um, in this video, you'll see the progenitors in pink and the neurons in green. See if this goes well. Excellent. Yeah. So this is kind of the 3D uh, layers of the organoids. So these are. Uh, this is using confocal microscopy um, of a, in this case, one month old organoid. Um, so these are 3D cell cultures, roughly spherical, a few millimeters uh, wide, and they're uh, creating the cells that you would see in human tissue. Um, so. I do like to show this video not only because it's beautiful, but also to kind of point out that although the cells are there, the structure is not exactly what you would see in an embryo. So that's something that the field is still working on to create uh, organoids that look more like the tissue. Um, these rosettes, as we call them, are things that would show up. Um, they will eventually become the vesicles in an embryo, um, but there obviously would be, you know, dozens of them in a single brain. So back to the PowerPoint. Okay, we gotta switch to the, to the slides. Um, so one of the projects that I'm working on, and this is being co-led by a wonderful postdoc, Ana Uskiano, an expert in neurodevelopmental uh, neurodevelopment in general, is to create a really detailed atlas, single cell atlas, of this specific protocol of human organoids. So we're working on uh, releasing this huge data set of single cell RNA seq uh, cells across time in these organoids for uh, this, the field to be able to kind of investigate whichever thing they're interested in in, these, in this data. Um, so this is a massive undertaking. We have you know, over half a million cells in this atlas from 23 days in culture up to six months in culture um, and looking at which cell types these organoids create over time. Um, so just kind of as an introduction, some of the things that we're noticing while creating this atlas, uh, of course, as I mentioned, this organoid is particularly reproducible. And what I mean by that is that organoid to organoid, 
um, at a specific time point, you're always making the same cells. Uh, this is something that's not been true in some of the previous uh, protocols making organoids. You might end up with one organoid that's mostly or entirely retina and another one that's in forebrain. Um, and this one, we're really making the same cells every time, which is important if you want to maybe you know, study a change in the organoids, you need a baseline that's going to always stay the same. Um, so I'm showing that reproducibility here by just plotting these, these UMAP plots. So each set, you know, dot on these plots would be a single cell. Um, and then down here, these are individual organoids and I'm showing which cells they contribute to this overall UMAP. And so you can see kind of each organoid contributing the same distribution of cells. Um, and so, like I mentioned, I'm a computational biologist. Looking at these UMAPs is nice, but I want it to be quantified. And I know this audience is a little more technical, so I'll go into some of the details of that. How do we quantify how reproducible this model is? Uh, this is another way to visualize that. So at uh, each time point, I'm plotting uh, each bar here is an individual organoid. And I'm colored by, of the cells that were sequenced from this organoid, this is the amount of cells that belong to each different cell type. Um, so this light green might be apical radioglia, which is a particular type of progenitor in the organoids. Um, and so from this visualization, we can start to think about what is the dependence or independence between where a cell falls on the x-axis here, meaning which organoid does it come from, and what cell type it is. Um, and so I quantified that using a mutual information score, which measures the dependence between two variables. Um, so in this case, a low mutual information score would mean high independence meaning it doesn't matter which organoid you come from, you're still going to be kind of randomly assigned to a cell type. Uh, and so this is the, the quantification of that mutual information between a cell's organoid of origin and which cell type it belongs to. Um, this mutual information score goes from zero to one. So we can first just see all of our scores are very low with around point, point 0.1 or below. Um, and they plotted here, these dotted lines, uh, mutual information scores that were calculated from published data sets of endogenous tissue. So human developing brain and mouse developing brain uh, all fell in this, this range between these dotted lines here. So we're noticing that our organoids reproduce at the same kind of rate uh, and there, it's not perfect due to maybe even technical noise as endogenous tissue. So that was, was great to see. Um, the next question we might have is how good are the cells we're making? So, you know, maybe we can identify them as particular types of neurons or progenitors, but do they look like human cells? Um, so in this case, we are again comparing to a previously published data set of human fetal tissue. Um, in this case, this is a data set from Dan Geshwin's lab at UCLA from around 17 to 18 gestational weeks um, of, the, of a fetal brain. And so I'm using a batch correction technique here to basically overlap our cells with their cells. Um, in this case, a Harmony uh, software package, which is to harmonize two data sets together. It's an excellent batch correction technique. Um, and you can see just some really good overlap between the organoid cells and human cells. Um, and if we look at where those cell types fall, we're getting some good overlap of, you know, the similar types of neurons overlap on top of each other. Once again, I wanted to quantify this. And so I turned to machine learning. Um, in this case, I'm using a random forest classifier. And what I mean by that is I'm training a classifier uh, on the human cells. So on Dan Geshwin's data set, to unsupervised learn the difference between all of these different cell types. Um, and then I'm using that classifier on our organoid cells. Um, basically saying, given that you have figured out what the differences are between these human cells, can you distinguish between the organoid cells in the same way? Um, and we see here kind of this nice diagonal where similar cell types uh, of the organoids are falling into those same classifications in the human. So for example, our immature interneurons are falling into what they called interneurons from the CGE, um, which are very similar uh, cell types together. So again, we kind of get this idea that not only is our, our organoids reproducible one-to-one, -one, but they look uh, very, they're very, uh, have high fidelity to the human tissue. Um, so there's a lot more analysis that goes into having these huge atlas, a lot of really interesting stuff we can do with this data, including getting deep into what might be the differences between cells grown in vitro and uh, cells grown in vivo. So obviously they're not going to be perfect. Um, so for time, I'll just encourage you to keep an eye out for our paper. It should be uh, soon, coming out soon, um, and go into what we can use these organoids for. So uh, another project that I've been lucky to be a part of um, is using these organoids to model autism spectrum disorder. Um, and this is a great collaboration with Bruna, Martina, and Sylvia, all of, all of which are completely vital to this. 
Um, but we were we were kind of uh, motivated to model this disease. It's a highly or model this condition. It's a highly prevalent condition. Um, but there's not a lot known about the underlying mechanism um, of this condition. So we do know that there's very complex genetics behind this condition, but we don't know how those genetic changes lead to differences in the brain. Um, and so we wanna learn not only about autism, but about all humans' brains by studying this difference. Um, so this is just an example of a study that came out recently that identified in this one study more than 100 genes that contribute to the risk of ASD. Um, and we can identify these genes as based on uh, exome sequencing, but don't know what these genes might be doing in the brain to cause differences. So the first thing we did is just look in our organoid data for where these genes are, when and in what cells that they're expressed in. Um, and you can see some of the genes uh, have specific expression. So this is a, a GRIN2B, which is a synaptic protein, is expressed specifically in more mature neurons, which makes sense. Um, but a lot of them are just kind of everywhere happen <laughs> and everywhere across time in our atlas as well. So we chose three of these genes, uh, CHD8, ARID1B, and SUV420H1, to study further, um, given that they were just kind of expressed everywhere. Let's figure out what they're actually doing in these cells. Um, so I don't know what this bar is, but <laughs> basically what we did was introduce mutations into pluripotent stem cells in these three genes, one at a time. Um, where we heterozygously knocked out this uh, gene based on the mutation that was found in actual humans with, with ASD. Um, so we have both the control and the edited uh, pluripotent stem cells. We can grow organoids out of those and then submit those organoids to a whole bunch of uh, te technology, single cell RNA-seq, ataxic, proteomics, and calcium imaging. I'll only get to some of this today, uh, but with this data set, we can ask a lot of really interesting questions, like even though these genes in wild type organoids are expressed across all cell types, which cell types are affected by mutations, uh, which biological processes are affected, when across maybe up to six months of this development are they affected, um, is there any convergence across these three genes that they're all histone modifiers, but they're very distinct pathways. Um, and does this effect depend on the human genetic backgrounds? Um, so we know that there's going to be this highly complex interaction with other genes um, bit from these three genes. So due to time, I'm gonna just focus on one of these genes today. It's actually the one that got cut out here, SUV420H1, uh, which is otherwise known as KMT5B. So this is an example. This is from one month, uh, one organized cultured for one month of uh, three organoids that were control, and then three organoids that had SUV420H1 knocked out. And one big difference that we can kind of notice right away is that there's this population of cells in the mutants that, uh, that appear in the mutants that barely, if at all, appear in the control. Um, and these are actually GABAergic or interneurons. Um, so this is exciting. There's something developmentally different going on in these mutants. Um, I'm going to get a little more technical again and talk about how we assign these p-values here, um, because this is not a simple question as just looking at these tisnes might lead you to believe. So the reason for that is because single cell RNA-seq um, and really most of the single cell technologies that are out there um, gives you what's called compositional data, meaning we're not sequencing every single cell in the organoid, we're sequencing a set number of cells and you get kind of percentages out. So if this green uh, population in, in this made up data set is neurons. We might have 33% neurons in a control, only 13% in a mutant. So does that mean there's a decrease in neurons or an increase in everything else? You're automatically going to get an, uh, the same total amount of cells at the end. So what the model that we chose to, to kind of quantify this, and there's, there's a lot out there in the field, um, is based on a missed effects logistic uh, regression. And you don't need to understand the math behind that, but essentially what we're doing is saying for each cell type, for each color in this Venn diagram, um, we're making a model first that gets information just about which organoid a cell belongs to. Um, and then we're making a separate model which gets information about which organized cells belong to and whether that organoid is mutant or control. Um, then we can ask the question, which of these two models actually fits the data better? Um, and if the second one fits the data better, then having a mutant and control information is important for knowing that. Um, so this is not going to tell us, I think importantly, 
what causes the change. We, we don't know from this that, you know, uh, green decreasing is the initial event and the other events follow, but it will tell us kind of which cell types uh, have the most important and most mutant related uh, uh, phenotype. So that's how we got this p-value from the GABAergic neurons. Um, in that case, it was a very obvious effect. They were kind of there or not there, these green cells. Um, using that technique, we could also notice some of the more subtle effects. So uh, one of the big ones that we found for SUV420H1 is in this pink population of cells, which are immature deep layer projection neurons. Um, so this is a particular type of excitatory neuron um, that shows up at this age um, in this protocol. And we can see this increase in uh, immature deep layer projection neurons due to mutation um, in this case. And since this immature deep layer projection neuron is, is one kind of stage on a, uh, a developmental gradient, we wanted to model this, uh, look at this using pseudo time. So this is a technique that will kind of show you, given your single cells, can we map a developmental gradient of those cells uh, from this one time point that you did the experiment in? Uh, so this is that result of that. I was using Monocle 3 software for this. Um, and we get this beautiful gradient from progenitors through the newborn neurons, so neurons that kind of have just left the cell cycle to this, in this case, the most mature population of excitatory neurons that we get at this time point, immature deep layer projection neurons, um, and this, this nice gradient of pseudo time uh, across these cells. So if we look at the pseudo differences in pseudo time distribution between the control organoids and the mutant organoids, we get this kind of extra bump uh, in the mutants for these uh, immature deep layer projection neurons. Basically, there's an a shift in this distribution for the mutants a little bit farther ahead in pseudo time. Um, and so what we can conclude from this is that there's an accelerated development of this, uh, these ne this neuron type in the mutant organoids. Um, so that's really exciting. We're getting asynchronous development. It's not just development of entirely new cell type as in GABAergic interneurons, um, but a change in the timing of development uh, of these excitatory neurons. And then uh, one last point about SUV, and this was true for all of the mutants that we looked at, um, that I think is really important is that which cell line we modeled these in really makes an, uh, has a big effect on the phenotypes that we know, that we see. So uh, here I'm showing the GABAergic interneuron uh, data set, and this is the data set I showed you before, where we had none in the wild type, but just a few cells in the mutant. In this data set, which is the same age of organoids from the same protocol, but in a different cell line, we have this huge appearance of interneurons. They almost take over the entire organoid. Um, and then we have another cell line that's kind of in the middle. So we are thinking of this as the human genomic background, the difference in these cell lines, as modulating the expressivity or the severity of these phenotypes. Um, and I think that's really important for, for future studies when you're going forward. If we just look in one cell line, you might be missing something. You might be seeing something that's much more severe than it would be by average. Um, and so we really need to, to be thinking about uh, modeling the population that you're interested in and not just one person. Okay, so I didn't show you data for CHD and ARID1B, but I'm just going to kind of summarize what we found for those things, which is uh, really that there was an incredible convergence between these three, uh, specifically on the cell types that were affected, so the GABAergic interneurons and these deep layer projection neurons that I talked about and on asynchronous development. So in some cases, they were accelerated. In some cases, they were actually decelerated. But uh, they all kind of showed the same asynchronous, asynchronicity. Um, although, and again, I'm not going to show this data, we think these are happening through largely distinct molecular pathways. Um, so although there's an asynchronous uh, asynchronicity, there's different effectors that seem to be changing, especially in the proteomics data uh, between these three. And so I'll just kind of tease, we have early days of a hypothesis of, of how this could be going on in the future. Uh, this could, this asynchronicity of development could be leading to abnormal activity of neuronal circuits um, in the organoids, potentially in the human brain. Um, so this experiment was done by Sungmin Yang, a postdoc in the lab, and he infected the organoids uh, with the virus and was able to do calcium imaging. Uh, on these organites. Again, I'm going to switch to the video of this. So 
So when you see this bright brightness appear here, this is some really beautiful bursting, calcium bursting of the organoids. Um, so we're getting a, a network a behavior of these neurons. Um, but I, uh, we don't know how similar this might be to the same time point in a, a human fetal tissue, but there definitely is neuronal activity going on here. Um, and so from doing a lot of these imaging studies, uh, Sun Min Yang was able to quantify some of the differences here. I think again, okay, good. Um, and so we found that actually the frequency and the duration of these bursting was changed in the organoids, was that was decreased in both cases in the organoid and the uh, SUV mutant organoids. Um, and so this is early days where we're still kind of getting into what might be causing this uh, beyond the asynchronicity of development. Um, it's possible that just having more interneurons and more uh, mature excitatory neurons in the case of SUV uh, could be leading to these sorts of phenotypes. Um, and so we're excited about where this, this might lead in the future. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll thank everybody uh, in my in my several labs, especially the people I highlighted so far, and especially my mentors, Paula, Joshua, and Aviv, um, who've been amazing. And there is a preprint of the ASD work uh, out, but the the final paper and the paper with the whole Atlas data will be out uh, in a few months, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so thank you for your attention.